Thank you so much for that incredibly kind introduction. Thank you all for coming. Um, thanks for the wonderful welcome back to Her Majesty's territory in the age of Donald Trump. Many of us are contemplating the virtues of constitutional monarchy again. So I <laughs> consider this a fact-finding mission for conservatives, disaffected American conservatives concerned about living um, under the Trump presidency. Uh, and it's been wonderful so far, so civilized here. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to talk a bit in a sort of rambling and discursive way around the topic of tonight's discussion because um, Randy told me the topic. He said, well, can you talk about what it means to be a Harvard Catholic? And I thought back on my four years of college and I thought, well, I'm not sure I was a very good Catholic during those, during those four years. And I, so I'm not sure that I have a sort of specific narrative of campus life that I can offer you as a perfect model for how to be a college Catholic during the four years of college that many of you are experiencing right now. Um, but I think, I think the term Harvard Catholic has a sort of broader resonance that refers to the larger question of how do you live as a religious person, not just in what's considered a secular age, but in the sort of well-educated upper class of what is considered a secular age, which is to say the most secular demographic portion of our supposedly secular society. And um, my own life story and trajectory is distinctive in certain ways, and it doesn't necessarily offer a model that people can follow, but I think it offers a story of why this sort of well, both why it is, first of all, possible to be a Harvard Catholic, but also why the forces that make it seem like it's impossible, the forces of sort of secular assumptions and secularism above all, are often a lot weaker than they look and much more sort of tissue thin and easily pushed through or easily, you know, pushed through from the other side, not our side at all. Um, so I'll start out by talking a little bit about my childhood, um, because I grew up um, in southern Connecticut um, as the child of a Yale graduate and a Stanford graduate. Um, my parents had met in Berkeley in the late 1970s, um, where my father was going to law school and my mother was in graduate school in English, and they moved back to the East Coast, and my father worked as a lawyer. Um, we lived in New Haven, college town, and so on, and so we were sort of, not perfect, but near perfect specimens of the sort of secular-leaning, liberal American bourgeoisie, which is not just the American bourgeoisie, it's the North American and Western bourgeoisie writ large. Um, and, you know, politically we were quite liberal. Um, one of my earliest memories was going with my mother um, at age four to cast a very lonely ballot for Walter Mondale and Geraldine Ferraro, um, which to anyone who follows American politics was a, a very lonely thing to do indeed. And my mother was very insistent that she was voting for Geraldine Ferraro because Geraldine Ferraro was going to be the first female vice president of the United States. And she wasn't. Um, so, so that was sort of the that was sort of our political background. And then religiously, we were maybe a little more religious than average for our sort of social and educational milieu. Um, we were Episcopalians, which was a very sort of Southern Connecticut kind of religion to be. Um, and my mother had written her college thesis on Flannery O'Connor and had sort of a you know, she had sort of an intellectual interest in religion. So, so we, were, we were not exactly secular. We did go to church on Sunday and so on. But we were, you know, sort of, we were sort of lukewarm Protestants, basically. Um, sort of part of the, you know, the last days of um, sort of WASP culture in the United States, WASP religious culture, at least. Um, but there were some wrinkles in our life. Um, and one of the wrinkles was that my mother was sick. She had sort of a mix of strange illnesses, allergies, chemical sensitivities, and so on that were increasingly debilitating and that doctors didn't really have much of an idea of how to handle. And that led us into a lot of explorations that sort of took us out of that basic sort of, you know, liberal upper middle class comfort zone. And some of those ex explorations were dietary. Um, we spent a lot of time 
eating diets that are now sort of mainstream and normal, um, uh, you know, brown rice and tofu and things like that, um, that were extremely not normal in um, any part of the United States in the year of our Lord, 1986. So if you wanted to get tofu in those days, you would go to some health food store run by an aging hippie, hippie and he would sort of shuffle out of the sawdust covered back wearing a Grateful Dead t-shirt and he'd have some tongs and there'd be these huge chunks of tofu sitting in water like icebergs and he'd reach down and pull one up and put it in a bag and you know I hated tofu oh my man um, but so but we spent a lot of time in that world in health food restaurants and I don't know if any of you have heard of macrobiotic diets it's this ex sort of extreme Japanese form of vegetarianism and we went to macrobiotic camp yeah, there was a camp for people who ate macrobiotic diets, and you went, and it was in Vermont, and it was on a college campus, um, and but it, but it had, you know, all this stuff had a religious element, too. Um, there would be talks about how macrobiotic diets were going to lead us to a higher form of spiritual consciousness and so on, and, you know, the health food store was always attached to a little bookstore that would have sort of, you know, a few Christianish titles and then a bunch of sort of paganish titles, you know, the Wiccan revival, women who run with the wolves, you know, you'd have the Utney Reader and Mother Jones and so on. And those were the magazines that I grew up reading, which made me the conservative New York Times columnist I am today. Um, so that was sort of part, part of our part of our explorations. And though I didn't sort of fully grasp it at the time, that was you know, it wasn't just about food. There was a clear sort of religious element to that culture that we were sort of at least halfway participating in. Um, and so that's sort of in its own way an example of the sort of inherent weakness of secularism that, you know, even that sort of not Christianity in that case, but sort of pagan spirituality keeps sort of filtering in around around the edges. First you eat the tofu, and then you run with the wolves. Um, but then the other thing that happened, the more important thing, was that my mother had a friend who said, well, you should come to this faith healer who has services in high school auditoriums all around the state of Connecticut. And my mother was like a faith healer, really, come on, you know. Um, but she let her friend drag her along one night, and it was, I think, sort of the kind of thing that she expected. It was this sort of brassy, dark-haired, Italian-American woman named Grace, who um, stood up with a microphone sort of like this, and had a band, and sang, and, you know, sang sort of Christian praise music, and then at a certain point started walking around the auditorium, a sort of bigger version of this, and sort of pointing to people in the aisles and saying, you're having trouble with your back you're having trouble, you know, you're having heart problems, you're having this and so on. Um, and the, the kind of thing that secular people think, you know, that faith healers do to fleece people out of money and so on. Um, and she pointed to my mother, uh, my, you know, Yale graduate, you know, Berkeley English degree sort of um, mother and and identified one of the myriad problems that my mother was having. And of course, you know, she's guessing. It's, you know, it's the kind of thing that sort of these people are talented. They know how to do this and so on. But my mother reluctantly got up and sort of stood in the aisle and let this woman put her hands on my mother's head. And then for any of you who are sort of familiar with the language of Pentecostalism, my mother was uh, what they call slain in the spirit, basically. And she went over. Um, and went down and lay on the floor of a high school auditorium in Connecticut having some kind of mystical experience for like half an hour or 45 minutes while the service just sort of went, around, went, went on around her and this happened to other people. They would have a blessing line at the end where everyone would come down and people would fall. Um, and that happened. And it was a life-changing experience um, for my mother and by extension for my entire family and for me. Um, although I never, in spite of having many hands laid on me, fell backwards and had any mystical experiences, which those of a Calvinist theological bent would say might suggest something about my ultimate destination, <laughs> which is why I joined Roman Catholicism. Um, but so that set us on this kind of, um, basically a kind of religious pilgrimage. We spent a lot of time going to this woman's faith healing services. Um, but we also spent a lot of time sort of going from church to church and sort of experimenting in different places and, you know, basically having the sense that 
that sort of an intimation of some larger truth had been revealed to us, um, and that you know, for my mother especially, the task was to sort of chase chase it basically to sort of try and try and figure out what you know where that truth most fully resided. Um, and in fact, so we you know we continue to go to. Episcopal churches. We went to Episcopal churches that had sort of various kinds of renewal, where they had you know sort of guitars and praise music, and had a little bit of an evangelical and Pentecostalist component. Um, my parents were involved in a failed attempt to plant an evangelical church on Yale's campus, um, and one of the most memorable experiences was actually the last time that I believe I was in Toronto. Um, there was a church uh, near the Toronto airport called the Toronto Airport Vineyard um, that had a sort of what, again, to use their language, a move of the Holy Spirit. And in this case, there wasn't sort of a single faith healer or a single charismatic figure. It was just that the church services seemed to be overtaken by these supernatural manifestations. And so people would come from all over and have experiences like the experience that my mother would have at Grace's services and wilder experiences still. People would roar like lions and run around the room and have, you know, laugh and they would call it holy laughter and it would go on a long time. And I was, a, you know, an early teenager at the time, so this was not my ideal religious experience, I will, I will say. Um, but but we drove all the way from Connecticut to here. Um, we stopped at Niagara Falls. Uh, we stayed downtown. We went to um, it's a place called Marche. I don't know if it still exists, but it was, you know, in, in those days, um, American cities hadn't yet had our wave of sort of urban renewal. So coming, coming from sort of early 1990s, New Haven and New York to Toronto, was like, this is the gleaming city of the future. It was amazing. And it still is. It still is. I don't, 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 don't get me wrong. In Trump's America, this will be the you know, capital of the revived dominion of something. Um, but, but we came here and so, and yeah, and I, um, with my little sister, we, I watched my parents speak in tongues, and, um, which was actually a you know, a fairly normal occurrence. Um, I, uh, I can still sort of remember the sort of the verbal, the verbal f forms that were associated with that. Um, and that was my childhood, basically. Um, during the week, I went to a pretty liberal, pretty secular series of private schools around New Haven with pretty liberal, pretty secular friends and classmates and teachers. And on the weekends, I went and watched my parents speak in tongues. Um, and at a certain point, of course, just to make things even weirder, um, my mother decided that actually the end point of this journey through the most ecstatic forms of American Protestantism was that we should end up as Roman Catholics. Um, and for her, there were various bridges um, that she crossed to get there that are more her story than mine. In my case, uh, again, as a teenager, you know, I, there are many Catholics who will say, oh, you know, the rote prayers are so tiresome and I wish Catholicism had more spontaneous worship and so on. And let me tell you, as a 14-year-old kid coming in and having, you know, having the Hail Mary and the Our Father instead of somebody putting their hand on my shoulder and telling me to testify to how Jesus had changed my life, I was all in for the road prayers. I was like, wait, you can come and you can sit in the back of the church and no one will ask you to stand up and do anything? This is fantastic. This is the one, truly, it's the one true church. Um, this is the church that God himself would have founded. Um, <laughs> But more seriously, I mean, I did, I did also, you know, I, my, my own conversion story at a sort of intellectual and theological level is pretty conventional. You know, I read the things that bright young Catholics read, like G.K. Chesterton and other writers like that, and I sort of, you know, I found the arguments for Catholicism's antiquity, its connections to the earliest days of Christianity, the sort of coherence of its teachings, the persistence of its teachings across long centuries of difficulty and challenge. I found all of that persuasive, and I, you know, deep in my, I mean, everyone has, everyone's probably born a little more conservative or a little more liberal, and probably I was born a little more conservative, and so all that antiquity and that aesthetic grandeur and so on, and the red robes and so on, it spoke to me. Um, and so I was very, even though my path was very different from my mother's, I was, I was um, 
very happy to be received into the Catholic Church. Uh, and so that, that was sort of the strange and distinctive religious upbringing that I had. And it was, and that was what I sort of carried with me into college at Harvard, which as you may have heard is a fairly secular university. Um, and then into a professional life um, in the media, which as you may have heard is a fairly secular industry. Um, and so this is where the question, so sort of the question of the talk comes in, right? Which is, you know, can you be a Harvard Catholic? And there are a couple of different ways to answer it. Um, and, but in, in my experience, there's sort of, there are things that are incredibly hard about being a Harvard Catholic, but I'm not sure that they're the things that people sort of assume are the, are the difficulties, at least for me. And this is just, this is a personal story. You're here for a personal story, so I'll be personal. Personally, I have always found the Catholic tradition and more broadly just sort of my, my own background, my association with all the weirdness of religion, not just Catholic religion, but all the weirdness of religion that I experienced and sort of saw secondhand as a child, I've always found it to be a tremendous intellectual and professional asset. I have never found that it handicaps me in any way and it, quite, quite the reverse. Now, you know, my profession is distinctive because I'm a journalist and not just a journalist, I'm a newspaper columnist. And so our job is to come up with interesting things to say day in and day out, week in and week out. And that's different from, you know, other professional vocations, right? The, the, you know, the brilliant surgeon is not trying to come up with a new way to do the surgery <laughs> every single Sunday in the way that the newspaper columnist is. So I, I will acknowledge that there is, you know, the, the journalist's path is distinctive in that sense, and there are sort of advantages to weirdness that may not be present in all vocations. But speaking only for myself, you know, weirdness is good. Weirdness connects you to the mass of human history and contemporary humanity in a way that sort of the, the life of a, you know, sort of the deeply conventional, secular, liberal, college-educated, upper-class lifestyle doesn't at all. That lifestyle is cut off. It's cut off from the human past, and it's cut off from the ways that most people around the world still tend to live. And I'm using the language of weirdness, but really the, the, there are these sociologists who have this term weird in all capital letters, standing for, I think, Western-educated, industrialized, something in democracy. I can't... Rost out that. Rost out that now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they, 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 but, but basically, their, their, their argument is that what I'm calling weird, the weirdness of sort of religious experience, religious questing, you know, religious history, religious tradition, and so on, that's not actually weird. That's the human race. That's the human experience. What's weird are the lifestyles that we have crafted for ourselves in the late modern developed West. <laughs> And those lifestyles are different from any lifestyles that human beings have had before. And they're lifestyles that offer, obviously, immense advantages of wealth and health and technology and so forth. Um, but, they're also, but they're also lifestyles that are sort of, you know, divorced from deep parts of the human experience um, that are, that, you know, that, that continue to shape human life around the world, have shaped the lives of all our ancestors, and that probably can't help breaking in and shaping our lives in certain ways, even though we try and try sometimes to repress them. So in that sense, yeah, what, what, I, what I tell people who are sort of struggling with the idea that, well, you know, sort of Catholicism or religion generally is unfashionable and strange and it doesn't seem to fit in with you know the sort of patterns of thought and the assumptions that most people have I say well why do you want to have the patterns of thought and the assumptions that most people have 
especially when you're in college. Isn't life in college allegedly supposed to be about experimentation and broadening your horizons and so on? Well, there's nothing more horizon broadening than getting in touch with the things that people have believed and the ways that people have lived and the things that people have considered important in the Catholic tradition for thousands of years and in the human tradition all the way back to when Noah and the dinosaurs lived together in peace and harmony. No, sorry. <laughs> That was, that was a flashback to an evangelical phase of my um, but no all, all the way back to all the way back to the beginnings all the way back to the beginnings of the human race and the beginnings of human consciousness and you know obviously I believe that the beginnings of human consciousness had their root in divine agency um, but even if you aren't a hundred percent sure about that it's still the case that human nature itself is religious it's always been religious. It will be religious again. It's still religious in most of the world today. And much of what people in the Western world do is, you know, sort of repress a big part of their nature. And with it, repress a whole set of ideas and traditions and experiences and works of art and literature and everything else that's all just out there as something waiting to be grasped if you're interested in grasping it. Or perhaps if, you know, God himself sort of reaches down and forces you to grasp it. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the, you know, that's the case for why I understand it's not easy to be a college Catholic, a Harvard Catholic, what, you know, what, whatever, whatever college you want to label it with, in the sense that you are going against the stream of opinion and you end up, you know, with particular issues where you're might be very much against the stream of opinion. But in terms of looking for the raw materials of a serious, a serious human life, a serious intellectual life, uh, a serious cultural life, and so on, the, the Harvard Catholic has an immense advantage. And he has things to draw on that other people just don't, and ideas to draw on that other people just don't, and exposure to things that enable him or her to understand the fullness of the world in a way that I think many elite Westerners really struggle to do in our own time. Um, the fullness of the world from Africa to the Middle East to Russia to China to Latin America, all the places around the world that are a little less weird than we are in the capital letters sense, um, that are weirder than us from our perspective, and that may not be on the same trajectory that the West has been on, and the West itself may not be on this trajectory forever. And so as we try and grasp what's actually happening in the world and what's likely to be happening in the future, having a grounding in something bigger and deeper and older than just you know, what's on your television set right now and sometimes what's just being taught in your classroom right now is one of the biggest assets that you could possibly have. So that's, that's sort of the case for why it's not easy, but why at least it's a, it's a kind of gift to be a Catholic in a cultural context that isn't particularly Catholic. Um, now, with that being said, I do think there are, there are other ways in which it's really hard to be a Harvard Catholic or, you know, an elite Catholic, whatever, whatever term you prefer. But they're more sort of personal than they are sort of intellectual, I would say. Um, and I was saying at, at the beginning that when, you know, when Randy just suggested the title for this talk, I was thinking about my own four years of college and thinking about what a poor Catholic I was then. And I wasn't a poor Catholic because I went to Harvard and I was surrounded by secular liberals and I got really nervous and sort of, you know, sort of tamped down my opinions and never said boo and was filled with self-doubt and so on. I mean, my, my basic faith was probably pretty sturdy during my four years in college and I you know, then as now, I was the conservative columnist for the school newspaper. I edited the conservative newspaper, so it was, you know, it was my job to have sort of, to have sort of strange Catholic opinions. Um, so I didn't sort of lose, I didn't lose my faith, I didn't lose the intellectual thread, but the practice of the faith, and I don't mean going to Mass on Sundays, I generally managed to do that. The 5 p.m. on Sunday was there for me when I needed it to be, but I generally managed to make it to Mass. But, you know, the, the part of Catholicism that's about actually being a Christian um, and not being consumed with your own ambitions and, you know, in college too, your own sort of 
lust is the technical term that people that people use. But you know, lust and ambition, right? Those are very powerful forces. And they're very powerful in college because colleges are filled with young people who are lustful and ambitious. But they're also just powerful forces and you know, ambition more so than lust as, as you get older. Um, I promise it does happen. Um, but you know, in the sort of elite educated class is a meritocracy, right? And what does that mean? Well, it means allegedly you know, that, that it's ruled by the best, the smartest, and so on. Well, how do you prove you're the best? Well, through frantic, strenuous competition with everyone else around you. Now, is frantic, strenuous competition with everyone around you for titles, honors, jobs, positions, wealth, homes, neighborhoods, schools, getting your kids into Harvard, and so on, is that the Christian life? Generally, probably not. But that is the life of Harvard, and it's the life of elite colleges the world over. Um, and it's not, so, and that sort of lifestyle doesn't challenge your faith in the sense that, like, Richard Dawkins challenges your faith. It doesn't tell you that, you know, well, actually, you know, Mary couldn't have been a virgin and so on. Like, you know, I mean, it, it might challenge sort of supernatural ideas implicitly, but mostly it just challenges it by, by, by telling you to focus constantly on what's right in front of your eyes, the goals that are right in front of your eyes, and on materialism, again, meaning not a sort of disbelief in God, but just a sense that the material and the immediate is the only thing that matters. Or, you know, religion matters and you go to church on Sundays, but what's really important is getting ahead and staying ahead and competing and succeeding and winning. Um, so when I think about my years at Harvard, when I think about the ways in which I failed to be a good Harvard Catholic, it was all about that. It was all about the fact that, you know, I was, I was focused on ambition and competition um, and, uh, you know, and girls. Um, but, but that, you know, the, that these things, that what Harvard taught me was that those were the things that mattered the most. Um, Harvard didn't teach me that there was no God didn't teach me that there was no life after death. It didn't teach me that, you know, Hume was right about a miracles and Aquinas was wrong. It didn't teach me any of that. It just taught me to compartmentalize religion and to focus on my own ambitions to the exclusion of everything else. So to the extent that I think there is a deep and sore temptation, a deep and sore challenge for you or anyone else trying to be Catholic at at the elite level of Western life, I think that is the deeper challenge. Um, yes, the intellectual stuff matters. Yes, if you're a Catholic, lots of people will think that you're superstitious or medieval or weird in various ways, but that stuff is superficial. That's not about your soul. That's not about the person that you really are. And your soul, what happens to your soul, happens when, in terms of what you value, what you prize, what you seek, what you prioritize. Um, and so that's, you know, that's, that's the challenge, um, is figuring out how to live in this world that teaches you those things while remaining interested in and committed to other things and more important things. Um, and it's a challenge that it's very, it's very easy, I think, to sort of try and basically well, much, much of Western culture now, much of Western culture for 20-somethings and 30-somethings is designed to sort of postpone the things that remind you about what's really important, right? So once you get married and have children, some of the, you know, there's a new set of temptations. Again, like I was saying, you're trying to get your kids into the best schools and, and so on. But Marriage and children brings an awareness of mortality. It brings an awareness of your own finitude. It brings a necessary giving to others um, that is that sort of counteracts, at least to some extent, the temptations associated with sort of with the meritocracy, basically. Um, but much of meritocratic culture now is dedicated to making sure you postpone those things as long as possible. Um, and making sure that you know that, that you know you get as you you succeed as much as humanly possible before you bind yourself 
to another person. You succeed as much as humanly possible before you, you know, bring into the world new people. Um, and I think that's sort of, for people leaving college now, that's in certain ways the, the sort of most specific temptation that they have to face. Because college itself, you know, I've been talking about how, you know, the sort of problems with being the sort of spiritual and moral problems with being a serious Catholic in college. But as a four-year chunk of your life, college is great. It's a great thing. It's a great thing to have a freedom to explore. It's a great thing to have sort of your ideas challenged and unsettled and to think anew and so on. And yes, it can put, it can put your faith at risk. It can also be an opportunity to deepen your faith. But either way, as a temporary thing, it's great. It's fantastic. And you should treasure it those of you who are still in college. It ends very quickly, I promise you. Treasure it. Um, but trying to sort of extend that lifestyle permanently is a big mistake, I think. And it's one that, you know, because the reality is that the truths about life, the deep truths about life, will catch up to you eventually no matter what. And again, this is sort of what I mean when I say at the beginning that secularism is weak. It's not weak in the sense that, you know, lots of people manage to get through their entire lives without really believing in God or confronting deep questions and so on. People, people do that. But it's hard because life is actually, you know, a series of extreme challenges that when you're in college, you can't even begin to recognize or fathom how extreme they'll be. And so the ability to sort of what the should I phrase this, the, the importance of maintaining faith and maintaining a connection to those sort of deeper sources of human knowledge and human happiness and human flourishing, college doesn't give you all that many moments. It can, for, you know, people can have deep, difficult, terrible moments in college, but as a general rule, it gives you fewer of those moments than the rest of your life will. Um, and so you don't wanna, you know, you, you wanna have an awareness as you go through these four years of that there is an unreality to college. There is an unreality. And there are realities ahead of you no matter what you do with your life, no matter what you do, whether you get married, whether you have kids, whatever vocation you pursue, there are realities ahead of you that where you know you will you will come face to face with the harshest truths about the human condition and when you face those truths you know maybe 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 you won't be persuaded enough by the answers that catholicism offers to persevere in the faith in the face of those challenges um or maybe you will but either way the answers that Catholicism offers are relevant in a way that is very difficult to understand and will always be very difficult to understand when you're 20 years old, but becomes ever more apparent, I would say, the older that you get. And, you know, I'm 36, uh, which is not that old, I think. Um, and I generally would, you know, I sort of shy away because I'm sort of a young newspaper columnist um, and a young person in the scheme of things from offering this kind of portentous, you know, your life will get harder life advice. Um, but I've actually been ill for the last 16 months or so um, with a uh, fairly debilitating case of um, Lyme disease. Uh, and I'm not well yet. And I haven't yet sort of passed through this experience to the point where I can sort of distill it for you and offer you a sort of clear picture of what this has meant in my life um, and sort of try and give it the treatment that I just gave to my childhood, my childhood religious experience and God willing someday I will. But the experience has brought home to me for the first time. I think fully, um, just the truth that is impossible for most people in college to grasp. I was in college, I didn't grasp it, which is that you won't live forever, or maybe you will. <laughs> <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<clears throat> like I was saying. <laughs> um, right. It's brought it's brought home for me. I'll be less portentous then. But I'll, it's brought it's brought home for me the the truth that I'm sort of spinning out for you, which is that yeah, you won't you won't live forever. Um, or maybe you will live forever, but if you live forever, it will be with God and not in this context, not in this form, not in this world. And how you respond to that reality, which is not just a reality for you, it's a reality for everyone you love, everyone you care about, everything that matters to you. It will all go. It will all die. It will all perish. And most of Western secular life is built on a denial of that reality, or at least a suppression of that reality. Um, and when I say that secularism is weak, part of the weakness is that that denial and that suppression too, like all things in human affairs, will pass away. And it will pass away for our civilization at some point in the unknowable future, but it will pass away for everyone in this room at some point in your life. And then when it passes away, the question is, what will, you, what will be there when it's gone, when that assumption is gone? And that assumption, look, that assumption is the assumption of our society. You know, I'm a Catholic, most of you are Catholic, but it's our assumption too. You can't, you can't escape, if you grow up in the West, if you grow up in the developed West, you can't escape at some level the feeling that actually this is all going to last forever because it's just a bedrock view of our society. And so when it goes away, the question for all of us and the question that, you know, what you carry through college and after will help you answer is, what will be left? What will be there for you when that idea finally dies? I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. Questions? We've got about 10 minutes. Yes. Ross, I hope you don't get compartmentalized for the rest of your career as the faith person because secular does not mean atheist. Secular means public. Like, for instance, the Good, the Good Samaritan Act in, in Ontario, if you help someone, um, it's, it's, a, it's informed by, a, by the Bible and Christianity, but it's a secular tenet, the Good Samaritan Act, is how good people behave in the public sphere. So I hope you get rid of the word secular to mean atheist, which it isn't. I, it's, it's, I, I hope that you can infuse the public sphere with the, your faith and spirituality and don't compartmentalize yourself as the ooh, religious Catholic writer. <laughs> I have I have other people who handle that for me. <laughs> so. But I don't right. no, secular I mean, is not is not um, atheist. Well no, I mean secular the secular is in many ways an invention of Christianity itself, right? That the idea of a secular sphere is partially a rooted in sort of Christian theological political traditions. I do think Secularism, I, I prefer the word secularism to atheism, though, in certain ways, because secularism isn't atheism, but I don't think our culture is atheistic, right? Like, no, our, I mean, our culture wants us to be atheistic. They don't, when, they, when they use the term secular, that means anti-religious, which is a co-opt of, it's trying to amputate religion in the public square, right. and that's... That's right. Our culture wants, I, I would say our culture wants generally to privatize religion in that sense, yes. Um, but yeah, no, I, t I certainly take your point. Sir. I want to ask a question uh, for maybe younger students here. I think one thing that's very different in Canada uh, than in the northeast of the U.S., where I'm originally from, um, is that the, uh, the culture has turned hostile here oh. towards religion, not just indifferent. As you said yourself, Harvard didn't teach you not to believe in God and all those things, right? It was a certain culture. But here, in fact, on most campuses across the country, pro-life groups have been thrown off by other student groups with the blessings of the administration. I mean, I know this because I was a newspaper guy like you. 
um, we have euthanasia in this country, which went steamrolling through. Uh, abortion is considered just normal. It is, you know, there's no, we don't have a law on abortion. But on university campuses, I think Catholic kids here, take the faith seriously, are facing a lot more problems, and I'm generalizing, that they probably do in most of the U.S., where religion still has, thrives a bit. Here, it's, I think it's really under attack. My question is this, just now that I've given you that yeah. little seminar, is for people, for people who are facing that, um, what would you suggest they do beyond just, say, going to Mass? I mean, do they have a role to engage, to even use the term fight back? Or, do you know what I mean? Because what I've been finding is many of these kids say, I don't want to raise my hand, I don't want to get in trouble, I don't want to be labeled, I don't want to be marked. This is very typical of this country, unfortunately. Why well, thoughts about? Well, I mean, for, first of all, I would say that I, it, unfortunately, I don't think the American experience and the Canadian experience are so different. Um, I do think when I was in college, and this is sort of yeah a caveat to my sort of boisterous case for sort of you know the richness of being a being a Harvard Catholic. But when I was in college, it was the late 1990s and early 2000s. Religion was sort of seen as on the upswing in American society. There was sort of a sense that you know, well, the secularization hypothesis was wrong, and so we have to sort of grapple with the persistence of religion. I would say in the last 10 years or so. Um, if for various reasons, sort of elite life in America has moved, uh, especially on college campuses, has moved to the left, become more sort of aggressively secular, with apologies for, right. for that term. And the flashpoints are, you know, a little bit different, um, but the conflicts, it's not pro-life pro -life groups getting kicked off campus, but it is, you know, Christian groups that um, uh, are sort of losing, losing um, sort of not accreditation, but um, sort of privileges, student group privileges, and so on. If they uphold New Testament sexual ethics, basically, and that's those are there are flashpoints of that all all over all over the U.S. Um, and that is a in general, like I said, it's a fair sort of counterpoint to my argument. You know, I was making an argument sort of on the personal and intellectual level, but in, yeah, it's true that the the cultural the cultural environment. Um, on campuses and in general is becoming, you know, it's never been great and it has become more difficult. In terms of what you do, um, I mean, I think it, you know, I think it varies with the person, right? I mean, I, I think that the, you know, people have different vocations and different strengths and so on. And there's no, there's no necessary argument that every Christian in a hostile college environment needs to walk around carrying a sign saying, you know, repent, repent ye heathens, and so on. Um, it's, there are people who should do that, basically. Um, there, are people who there are people who have a vocation for, for lack of a better word, conflict. Um, and since I sort of argue professionally, I guess I'm probably one of them if I assume that I've, you know, chosen my vocation to right. Um, so there, there are people who need, there are Christians on campuses who have an obligation to be engaged and to speak up and argue in class and to, you know, write for the newspaper and to form student groups and if those student groups are kicked off campus to go off campus and so on. And there, and there are Christians around the country, whether it's the U.S. or Canada, who have an obligation to support students when colleges turn hostile to them and there's a I mean again I don't know all the details of in sort of the Canadian context but in a lot of US contexts you end up sort of you know you get kicked off campus so you need off campus space you need off campus support and so on and there are sort of efforts that um, groups off campus make to support Christian students and so on um, but I yeah but all I would stress is that each individual needs to discern sort of the appropriate role you know for, for some people as catholics the best response to being in a hostile campus environment might be to sort of be be winsome and you know pray pray and pray novenas and so on you know to be sort of devotional in a private way and not always be argumentative in class i think that there's a discernment that each individual has to make to figure out both what i guess what God wants of them, what their talents indicate they should do, and what sort of what form of witness 
you know, sometimes being the being a quiet witness where people say, "Oh, I didn't realize she was a Christian." I'm, that makes me think differently about Christians and so on. That can be very powerful too. So I would just encourage a sort of diversity of responses to a hostile environment instead of ju not just saying, "Well, you know, we either need to man the barricades or sort of retreat." Some people need to be on the barricades. Some people need to be doing other things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for commenting about the ordinary Christian life on campus. I think that's a good point. And my friends and I are often discussing how throughout university and our 20s we're being asked, what's next? What are you going to do next? And there's this sort of needing to account for your existence, which is very much fed by the merit meritocratic culture that you discuss. So how can Catholic students be a sign of contradiction even within Catholic culture and attest to the eternal questions and the problems of the soul. If we say we're in school trying to uh, study noble lives or not settle for less than the spiritual grandeur of the faith or to become a saint, that might all sound a little bit awkward, but if students are actually trying to uh, do those things and resist the conventions of uh, the clamoring for success and uh, acquiring things, what may be the way to answer the question of what are you going to do next in a way that says, well, I see things in the light of uh, accounting for these problems of the soul and eternity? Well, you could say I'm going to, you know, found a, um, found a major religious order that will trans <laughs> transform Canadian society over the next 50 years. I, that would be sort of, that, I, I'm, I joke, um, but it's, you know, the, 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 again, there are sort of an infinite, infinite variety of ways, right? Presumably, that, that you could do this. But, you know, what Catholicism offers that is distinctive in our society, I would say, are three, th three things. Um, community, family, and uh, we will call it celibacy. Um, and those are all in different ways countercultural paths. And the, the path of community is a path um, of basically, you know, you, I've known lots of people who sort of, myself included, you have a group of friends in college, you have a community in college, you build a community in college. I've never had a community of friends more intense than the community that I spent four years with, you know, my guys. Um, and now me and my guys live at minimum, a hundred, you know, one of them is 70 miles away from me, one of them is in California, um, one of them's in Korea, uh, one of them's in Kansas, you know, and um, I didn't, it never would have occurred to us at the time to like try and in any way shape our lives in such a way that we would keep that community together. Um, but you could, you know, if you have a group of, I mean, friends, sort of, you know, obviously this gets entangled in sort of romantic relationships too and so on, but, you know, people can form intentional communities. Um, and I, I, you know, I've known some young Catholics who have tried to do that and sometimes it doesn't work out. Sometimes it ends in disaster, as many things do in human affairs. Um, but sometimes it does work, and, or sometimes it works for a little while. Sometimes, you know, you have seven friends and three of you all decide to go to the same town or city together after college and get an apartment together and sort of build on that. Um, and that, you know, sort of making, making life decisions with sort of your closest friendships in mind is countercultural. Um, people do it, but it's countercultural. And, but it's something that, uh, you know, has sort of deep <laughs> Catholic roots. So that's one thing. The second thing is family. Um, this is sort of the obvious, you know, the sort of among conservative Catholics, it's sort of the obvious countercultural thing. It's like, you know, well, we're going to get married younger than other people and have more children than other people and so on. And, and that too sometimes can lead to, you know, mistakes and fumbles and so on. And it's, you know, the, the plan where you move to the farm with your true love and have seven children and raise organic something or other and, you know, keep the world out. Well, sometimes there are ticks on that farm. And <laughs> let me tell you. Um, but so, you know, you don't want to, 
basically you don't want to rom- over over romanticize family life. I think conservative Catholics, one of our vices is the over romanticization sometimes of of family life. But nonetheless, it still is, you know, getting married at 25 instead of 34 is countercultural. Having four kids instead of two kids is countercultural. Having nine kids is very countercultural. And God, God bless you if you do. We're at three. Um, and man. Um, but so, right, so there's family. And then finally, there's, you know, there's the priesthood and there's the religious life. And this is where, oh, historically, the, the, when we look back on what has renewed Catholic culture um, in the past, it's been Ignatius founding the Jesuits. It's been, you know, Catherine of Siena. It's what, what is. What is the most powerful Catholic figure of the, 20th, of the 20th century based on what we saw play out in the mass media a couple weeks ago? It's a woman from Albania who founded, who founded an order of nuns. Um, you know, so, and, and in terms of as long as sort of the sacramental life of the church needs priests, as long as the life of the church in general needs people who are willing to sort of give up on give up marriage and family in order to serve the church and everyone else more directly, then religious vocations will remain a f- most powerfully countercultural thing you can do. And, you know, I'm not a priest, so it's easy for me to say, well, you know, you should be a priest, right? So don't take it from me, take it from a priest. Um, we've got a couple right here, they'll, they'll be happy to talk to you afterwards. Um, and we'll never hear from you again. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so those, you know, that's sort of a simple, sort of simplistic answer. But I I think thinking about it in those terms, community, family, and celibacy, the religious life, and so on, is a useful way. And then, again, with the the caveat that the more sort of steeped in the existing conservative Catholic counterculture you are, the more likely you are to sort of over-romanticize those things. So first, you want to you want to focus on those things as countercultural goals. And second, you want to remember that, you know, life is hard and difficult, um, even or especially for would-be saints. And even if you're trying to lead sort of the perfect countercultural Catholic life, things are not always going to work out as you expect. So thank you guys so much. <laughs>